with exponent rules and applying them in an engineering scenario. Now remember, whenever we are using an exponent, it's effectively just multiplication gone crazy. The exponent, the number up in the top, tells us how many times we are multiplying the number in the bottom by itself. Now I'm saying number, it could be a variable. Like in our first example, we have x cubed. Cubed, 3, tells us we are multiplying x by x by x. Thus, if we are to the first power, it's almost like the exponent just disappears. We have our x by itself. But when we have x to the zero power, we're never multiplying it by itself, so it actually becomes 1. Now, whenever I am raising something to a fraction, we have to pay attention to that denominator in the exponent because that will be the root that we are interested in. So think about square root, that is to the one-half power. In this case, we are to the a root. a could be any number. If our exponent is negative, instead of being in the numerator, it flips it over into the denominator. So x to the negative b power is the same as saying x to the b power in the denominator of a fraction. Now moving over, we have our distribution rules around exponents. If I have two numbers inside of a set of parentheses, everything being raised to the c power, I can actually distribute that exponent over both of my variables. So I would have x to the c power times y to the c power. Same idea even if I am dividing the numbers inside of those parentheses. So here I have x to the d power over y to the d power. Then you might ask yourself, well what if my number on the bottom is the same, but the exponent is different. Well, in this case, we have x to the a power and then x to the b power. We add the exponents together. So we have x to the a plus b power. If I'm dividing those two numbers, x to the c power divided by x to the d power, it's a similar idea. We're combining the numbers in the exponent, but instead of adding them, we're subtracting them. So we have our x to the c minus d power. And then finally, what if I have an exponent that is then being raised again? So I have x to the a power to the c power. Well, we don't subtract them, we don't add the exponents, we actually multiply them. So I have x to the a times c power. So hopefully we're bringing back some memories with these exponent rules, but now we're actually going to flip over and apply them in an engineering scenario. Now I'm an environmental engineer, so we do a lot of pipe design for sewers for drinking water systems. Either one works. Now, the example you see here, we're using Manning's equation, which is one of our standard engineering equations where we're determining the flow rate or how fast water is moving based on the pipe size, the diameter, as well as the slope of the pipe. So we have Manning's equation, which has some interesting exponents in it, but it also has two variables in it that we might not have numbers for. What if I'm only given pipe diameter? Diameter is not in that top equation. So we actually introduce two more equations that help us solve Manning's equation. So we'll pick up together to do the math part of this problem, and you'll learn more about what the heck is happening in these engineering equations in a few years when you take fluid mechanics or water and wastewater treatment. So let's start off with our combined Manning's equation. So we have Q, K over N, and then we're replacing A with pi D over 2, all of that squared. Now we're going to have a nasty looking combined term. 
because Rh, which is raised to the 2 thirds power, actually has a big fraction inside. So we have pi d over 2, all of that squared, over pi d, all of that to the 2 thirds power. And then at the end of Manning's equation, we have s to the 1 half. So what I want to know is once I reduce this down, what is going to be my exponent on my diameter? Well, we can do that using the rules that we have over here. Let's start off by isolating the parts that have diameters in them. It is this middle section. Luckily, this front part and the S, I can ignore for this problem. We might need it later, but not for this one. Instead, we'll reduce down and figure out how to combine these three D variables into a single term with one exponent. So if I look at the first part, D over 2 squared, we have our exponent. It distributes over both parts of the fraction. So this becomes D squared over 2 squared. Then we can move over to the right-hand portion. We've got some big brackets, so we need to look at what is happening inside of the parentheses first. But we also have parentheses inside of parentheses. Oh, joy. So, pi divided by pi. That cancels out. Kind of handy. In my numerator, I have, again, my d over 2 squared. So, my numerator there is d squared over 2 squared divided by diameter all to the 2 thirds power. Well, d squared over 2 squared, I can start ignoring this 2 squared part, but over here I have d squared and then divided by d d squared is d times d, and then divide by d, I've done, done what I've done. So, diameter gets rid of that exponent in there. So I can rewrite this one more time. I have d squared divided by 2 squared times, this reduces all the way down to just d over 2 squared to the 2 thirds power. One more reduction, d squared over 2 squared, everything distributed, d to the 2 thirds over 2 squared, uh, to the 2 thirds, we are multiplying 2 times 2 thirds, so 2 to the 4 thirds. Now, the final combination that I need to bring together in my numerators here, d squared times d to the 2 thirds. Since I have the same number, we get to use this rule over here. So this will actually reduce down to d to the 2 plus 2 thirds power, or 8 thirds. So 8 thirds is my final answer for what the heck is the exponent when I reduce down Manning's equation to only determine everything based on variable d, the pipe diameter. All right, that was your review of exponent rules and an example. Hopefully this example will help get you ready for your homework problem.